Hey, good morning, everybody out there in COT. You guys hold on a minute. I'll bring up the chat room and possibly say, I have escaped. Do you guys know I make the worst patient a doctor could ever know? I do. I make the worst patient. I don't listen to anything. I never comply. This is the worst patient anybody could ever have. Doctors tell me one thing, and I give them my diagnosis. They tell me something else, and I give them my diagnosis again. They tell me don't do this, that, and the other. They turn around, and they can't find me. This is how it works. I'm the worst patient ever. Good morning, you all. Some of you may have noticed that the uh, website domain was gone this morning. There was no Council of Time. Strange, huh? Someone attempted to wipe. Uh, we're, we're doing a move. And no doubt they heard it, right? No doubt they heard it, but we're doing this move, and uh, I guess someone tried to take advantage and uh, attempted to secure the Council of Time domain. Of course, that didn't work. But they actually tried to steal it, I guess you could say. Saying that they were the owner of the site. The problem is uh, that um, it just didn't work out for them. They left a bunch of fingerprints, too. So, too bad for them. Because that is, that is stealing. We don't have to do anything. The person was caught by themselves. We have some very interesting folks in COT from quite a few places. We really do. And so, um, yeah, they look after us a lot. In fact, there are a lot of people they look after. From state troopers to, we have a lot of state troopers that join us at COT. Lots of those. Lots of those. We have a host of other folks, too, in law enforcement. And so they take, they take care of a few things uh, for us a lot. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing. We are going through with this transition. And uh, the move is going fine. It is going fine. It's a methodical process. The hope is that once again, well, even this, you know, we hit last, uh, last, the last day, was an increase of 200,000 more visitors to the site. And the traffic is, is, is unusual, unusual. But I'm beginning to find out why. This election, this election process has really caused uh, some people to try and get a grip on what's happening. Every time these things take place, that's when people turn to biblical things. That's when they turn to biblical things. And, and when they turn back to, because we had, we just alone, overseas, outside the U.S., um, there's 2.8 million, right? And it's growing. It, it really is growing. This is just from overseas. Um, from within America, that you're adding another 1.8 million. And so that's a lot of traffic. Here's what we're going to do. There will be... Um, we're going to have to begin to document quite a few things. I mean, quite a few. It will have to be a type of uh, library, I guess you could say. Um, so that means we have to be very responsible with what we talk about, right? Um, you know, I would, uh, I would love it if we would stay centered on a few subjects. And, and we'll begin to talk about that. I'm planning on having some AM meetings, likely every day if I can, uh, with some of the folks in COT, even the folks that are in Skype. I wanted to do a Skype call yesterday. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, so we can all speak to each other uh, together. And that's going to be excellent. Now, I am in a strange position right now. Medically, but don't worry. 
I'm confident that will resolve itself. I do believe it's only uh, a test. It really is. It's only a test. Of, of all things, it's very important that, um, you know, your whole life uh, is uh, basically how you respond to everything in your life. You guys know that? Your life is not about what anybody else does. It's about how you respond to every situation you're going to be in. That's how your life is evaluated. In fact, if you go and read the Bible, how you respond to everything, right, is the measure of you. How you respond. So now, when you respond of yourself, then the measure of you is in yourself. But when you respond by the word, the Lord gives you strength to continue to respond by him. All too often, our flesh wants to respond with corrupted and vile things. My definition of vile is, is, is probably different from everybody else's. What people call, what, what you may call mundane, is seriously wicked to me. Right? There's just some wicked things out there. What most people say, you know, that's the way things go, I find detestable. But what you may say is disgusting. I don't see it that way. Right? You may see a person doing activities or having a foul mouth in public. Well, I only understand that they're compromised by their flesh and they need to be taught the way. What I find detestable are those who say they love the Lord and their activities are extremely, extremely deceitful. It, it is not those outside the house of God that are shameful. It's those inside. It's the ones that get in the house of God and they refuse to go further. The ones that redirect people into how they interpret things. I find that vile. I really do. And it's because the Lord's churches are made by him, not by us, not by me, not by anybody else. We don't own his churches. We do not lead the way the church should go. Jesus leads us. And any time we follow the Holy Spirit, there's so much clarity and a pure walk in that. But when mankind does it, you get these spiritual flags. Now, a spiritual flag is very different than a flesh flag. If you're feeling a certain way about something, that's your flesh. When your soul is cautioned about something, that's the Holy Spirit. When your soul is. When your soul is cautioned about something... Your flesh is numb to it. It really doesn't feel anything. And then something in your heart will say, stop. It's a still, small voice. Never feelings. My feelings have lied to me all throughout my life, so I don't trust them. I don't trust the flesh. It can easily be moved by the environment it's in, right? Because if you go to Antarctica, which, by the way, reaches temperatures of, uh, what is that, M minus 136 degrees or something like that. If you go there, you're cold. Your body is subject to the environment. You go somewhere else, you're hot. When you get hot, you become agitated. When you're cold, you become sorrowful. So your body is prone to the environment. And the first function of your body is to survive. The first function of the spirit is dictated by our Father. Our Father. There are a lot of things surfacing. Well, we've got to... How many of you... Uh, despite your personal sufferings, especially those that are sick right now, 
Despite your sufferings, you still choose to follow Christ, no matter what. How many? Because if you persist and you choose to follow Christ, follow him. Follow him always. I know sometimes people get desperate in mind. Follow him always. You know, if we can take advantage of the opportunities the Lord has granted to us, you will not be touched from what's forming right in front of our faces. And what is forming, by the way? I don't know how else to put this. But your life, whether you're ready or not, is taking a very sharp turn. It is not for the better. Because all humanity is doing this. I don't know if you know, but they're going to have a racial war. I don't know if you know this, but many people are going to bail out. They're going to leave. They're going to bail out. I mean, they're just going to bail out. But they won't believe they have bailed out. Part of this delusion is when people uphold things of Christ, thinking that they're upholding it righteously, but they won't be. The falling away is when people still follow the words of Christ, but they do so based upon their own interpretations and interpretations of man. In other words, there will be an anti-church which looks just like the real church, but the precepts will be messed up. They'll be messed up. You know why? Because mankind has given so much excuse to their flesh. They have incorporated flesh into the pure word of God. Therefore, it is a corrupted word. And there are some folks who are in that strong delusion and they will never escape. They won't escape. And this has been happening for years. It's just gaining momentum faster and faster. If you condemn your own flesh, God bless you. But if you defend it, may he have mercy upon your souls. That's what puts you in danger. I thank my Lord every single day. He gives me an opportunity to perfect those things I did not perfect yesterday. But I do condemn my own flesh. And when you do so, you become strong in the Lord. And when you become strong in the Lord, you're not moved by any circumstances. And when you're not moved by any circumstances, you are sober. Anybody know what the opposite of sober is? Every time God is talking about soberness, he always uses, when he gave it to the prophets, he talked about an opposite. Now, we say, we say drunk, right? That's what we say. But you read certain things in the word of God, like the woman who's drunken with the blood of the saints. Right? She's drunken with the blood of the saints. You read all this stuff, but the woman, the woman, and anybody else who was drunken, if they're saturated with things, right? Their head is sick. They have a sickness. They are sick. They're sick. In Isaiah, in Isaiah, the Lord tells us about wounds through Isaiah. Why we don't listen, I don't know. But you have people who have had wounds for years, and you know what they say? In time, I'll get over these wounds. Well, they said that same thing 20 years ago, and they still have the wounds. You guys know that. 
They still have the wounds. In fact, if you read the book of Isaiah, chapters 1 through uh, 6 or 7, you're going to see the end times. Isaiah starts backwards. It's, it's quite beautiful. Right? But Jesus, or, or the Lord, the Lord, Right, as giving this. Well, actually, when the word was given to the prophets, guess who gave the? Guess who gave that? That is the word of God, who is Christ. Any time they received the word of God, they did receive Christ. Christ is the word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. I think that's awesome, right? But I want to give you guys a process that is absolutely driving more and more into this. Strong delusion, because God gives them over to a strong delusion that they would believe a lie. That they will, uh, that they would, they're all going to be damned because they loved not the truth. Listen to me. If you love the truth, guess what you're going to do? You're going to accept nothing but the truth. Nothing. Nothing but the truth. If you don't love the truth. You're going to teeter-totter back and forward. You're going to pick and choose. That would be like somebody saying, I like mint chocolate chip ice cream, but I don't like the mint or the chocolate chips. Right? So they start picking out stuff they don't like so they can have what they do like. Well, then that person just lied. They don't like mint chocolate chip. And worse... You can't separate the mint. That's like a child that says, oh, yes, I like hamburgers. Right? And they take everything off of off the hamburger. Or, or, I'm sorry, they leave everything on the hamburger and eat the lettuce and all this. And then they take the burger, take it out. They don't want the hamburger. They want all the rest of the stuff with the hamburger that's picking and choosing we've done the same thing with scriptures in fact we've been taught outside of context so much it shocks us when we read things in context we really have you can't pick and choose scriptures to fit anything that must be read in context we will never learn if a scripture is used outside of context because you can take scriptures and make them fit any situation Any, you can do that to any book. You can, you can write a brand new book if you pick and choose those things in a book that you do like. And mankind, is, they're, they're just masters at this. They make up their own stories. Well, the Lord didn't write this book so that we could pick and choose, but to give us truth. And people say, well, I want the truth. But they refuse to read things in context, and they won't take it in. To live by what they just read. There's simple things. We have to understand now. Like God's love. God is in control of all things. But all of us have suffered in our lives. Under the watchful eye of the Father. Haven't we? We have suffered many things. And he did not rescue us. Did he? But he loves us more than we know. So let me give you an example of that. Right? If you had a person who is addicted to drugs and you continue to give them money because you're trying to help them, because you care for them, and you know they're going to buy drugs with it, right? What happens if you continue to give them the money? What happens? Because you don't want to see them go through withdrawals and be sick and go out of their mind. What happens if you continue to give them the money? They will die. Through your passions for the person, you're helping to kill them and you don't know what to do. We were those drug addicts and the drug was sin. And the Lord said, no more money. That's what he said. No more money. You see, let me share something. It's very easy to give a drug addict money. It's very difficult to say no. 
It's difficult to say no. You can only say that and stand to it by way of love. Because if you really care about a person, you will never help them to kill themselves. That's real love. Real love is normally not interpreted as love itself, but because people can't see the whole thing. They'll always say, it's not love because I'm suffering. The drug addict will see that too. They'll say, you don't care because you're not giving me money for what I absolutely need. My body is hurting. It's this, that, the other. I'm going crazy. If you care for me at all, give me some money so I won't feel this discomfort. That's what a drug addict will tell you. We were like that with our sins. And the Lord said, no more money. He refused to give us any more substance so that we could go and sin again. He cut us off. When we were cut off, our lives began to fall apart. And when you hit rock bottom, of course, you went through the depression period and all this, and you thought God didn't love you or anything else. And then you began to go up, back up to him in love with understanding. Now you're beginning to realize, yes, he does love me, and all those things were purpose to break me. You see, it takes love to break you. You won't be broken by any other means. To be broken, that you may have liberty, takes love. To be broken, to be controlled, takes force. God never did anything to you by force. But he stopped giving you things that allowed you to continue in your sin. A drug addict, they think they're making the right choices every time they buy drugs. Because it's going to ease their pain and they can't do anything about it. They're not going to stop just all of a sudden stop. Until the resources are cut off and they go into a panic. Then they say, how am I going to get so and so for this, that and the other? They have anxiety issues and everything else. We were the sin addicts. That's what we were, sin addicts. And our Father in Heaven cut us off because He loves us. So then every portion of suffering in your life, whether you think you did it or not, was necessary to break you from this world of sin. Let me ask you this. The Father sees you in full view. He broke you from sins. What happens? What do you think? How do you think he looks at you when you look back into that sinful life saying, I, I, I want to go back? After all he did for us, and then we go, the same sin, we begin to look back on and, and, and think about going back. See, that's what happened to Lot's wife. That's why she died. Hmm. Now, let me talk to you about something else. There's a spirit of excuse in this world concerning God's word. A spirit, I'm going to call this a spirit of excuse. Here's what the excuse is. When it comes to doing God's word, the reason why a person will give an excuse is because they know the truth and don't do it. They just won't do it. That's called rebellion. There's no excuse for rebellion. Everything we know of that now, I'm going to give you some responsibility. Because I certainly, uh, this is where my lumps come from. Listen, you know the cartoons where the cartoon character would get hit over the head and this cone thing would pop up? That's called a lump. I'm telling you now that over the course of my life, I have some huge lumps. You don't get a lump because you don't understand. You get lumps because you do understand. That's a lump. The Lord requires of us all those things we know. 
He requires 100% of us and nothing less. All those things we understand, he allows us to comprehend that we may walk by them. But you know what we have done? Allow the spirit of excuse to come in. The problem is, we know the way. And we are rebellious and refuse to walk in the way that we understand. So in essence, how can he trust us with the larger things? If we can't be stewards over the small things. And I know preachers have talked to you about this concerns money, right? But listen, God has given us small things we can comprehend. And we still won't do them. Rebelliousness. When you don't do what you know you should do, that's called rebellion. There is no excuse for rebellion. I'd rather be condemned of my father than to give an excuse for my flesh. The fact is, we know everything we do wrong. We know what we're doing. We're so worried about our reputations, foolish things. A true coward gives an excuse for his flesh. That's a true coward. And I use that word coward because they're not in the fight. And all of us at one point in time have been cowardice. The spirit of excuse is causing people to... When you excuse your flesh, you begin to look in the word to try to find evidence where you're not guilty. Now your study is corrupted. Because you're looking for excuses. Now your study is corrupted. Are you folks, are you beginning to see the chain of events that can happen in your life? These chain of events can and will destroy you. Right? They can and will destroy you. These excuses. Isn't it easy to respond to a person if they make you mad? But it takes strength to hold back your own flesh, doesn't it? And again, the Lord said, how can he trust us with anything of his if we can't be trusted with the small earthly things we have? This is responsibility. Simple discipline and responsibility. Our discipline, we have no discipline. Because we if we don't get our way, we complain. It's always going to be somebody's fault. The word fault is used. And it shouldn't be used. But the truth is that spirit of excuse comes from rebellion. See, you give an excuse to find a reason not to do what you know how to do. You you excuse yourself from doing it because you want to do how you feel. You want to do those things based on how you feel and get away with it. And then you, you become so corrupted, you go back to the Word of God to find evidence so you can excuse yourself in front of everybody else. That's why I don't like the statement that, well, the Lord knows. Well, of course he knows. When a person says, well, the Lord knows, then that means we are telling on ourselves. I'm telling you the truth. We're telling on ourselves. When when somebody says, when, when you know what, when we say that about ourselves to somebody else saying, well, the Lord knows what I'm, what I'm, you know, I, I'd be, I know what, what we're doing. Is we're telling on ourselves. And what that is, is we refuse to bow before our creator. 
to bow before our creator is to submit. To submit is not to defend anything outside of his rule. You can't bow before a king outside of the kingdom of that king. Do you know that? You can only bow in the kingdom. And when you bow in the kingdom, you have surrendered all things outside of the kingdom. Before you go and see a king, you must be searched and stripped of many things. Why won't we go to our father the same way? And listen, we don't have to leave the presence of our father. Why would anyone want to leave? Why? Hmm? Who told us we had to leave the presence of the Father? Jesus said we could be there continuously. Pray without ceasing is to be before the Lord continuously. But the truth is we are rebellious. And guess what? Children of rebellion are under the command of the prince of the air. The prince of the air works in the children of disobedience. That's a scripture. Mm. That's a scripture. And it stems from all these unknown wounds we have. Why is it that a Christian who believes in Christ Jesus will refuse to be healed of their wounds? What makes a person walk around with bitterness? See, if you, if you have a wound, you're also bitter. You really are bitter. When you have a wound, you know how I know? Because God revealed that to his servants, the prophets. That's why. He revealed that same thing. In fact, he said, wounds make your head sick. He was not happy with Israel because of this condition. All the things that were done against Israel that they thought they didn't deserve, God rebuked them for that. He said, you had stinky, infected sores, and the whole head is sick. Now you can't even think straight. When you're full of wounds, what do you do? You alter everything. Here's how it works. Has anybody ever had a broken toe, a broken finger, or one of those, a jammed thumb or jammed joint? When this happens, you know that if it touches anything, or if you burnt your hand, or if you cut your fingers or anything, you know that when something touches it, it's going to hurt. So what do you do? You alter the way you walk, don't you? You alter the way you walk to protect the portion of your body that's injured. You're not walking right because you're protecting the wound. In a spiritual sense, we have been walking around with these putrefying sores. And it truly alters the way you walk. You cannot walk. You cannot walk like that. And so the Lord gave a rebuke. And then Jesus gave a rebuke. He said, you ought to ask for healing. And stop walking around like this. I mean, we're talking all the servants, the prophets. They told kings. They told people. Jesus told us. The disciples told other folks. And we still don't listen. We fail to listen. Some of us have had wounds for 40 years, 30 years. The same condition as Israel, and the father gave a warning over that. Which, and then he went into purging his vineyard because of that very thing. You see, because a wound can alter the way you walk, 
It is a breeding ground for rebellion. Once your walk is altered, you start doing worse things. When you do worse things, you're given fully over to a reprobate mind. Now you think wrong things are okay and you're totally gone. How did it begin? A wound. See, you didn't know this, but even your wounds are managed. How you respond to these things in life is the true measure of you. It is not what you say. It's how you respond. Your responses to everything in life is the truth of all of us. We have beautiful intentions in the heart. But when you respond, you respond by way. You respond by what rules you. Your responses are everything. Everything. And if you're ruled by disobedience, your responses are going to be in disobedience. If you're ruled by love itself, your responses will always be loving. And I'm talking about when people wrong you, when people do things to you, when, when your flesh is absolutely broken by people. Even if you're harmed. Would you look at the people like Stephen did and say, lay not this sin to their charge? That's one of the most beautiful things I've seen in the Bible other than the cross. For a man to be stoned to death, bleeding from the head, nearly passing out, and then he prays while he's being hit by stones in the face and everywhere else, and he says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Lord, don't Charge them for this sin. That is the most beautiful thing. That is so beautiful. But you know what we do? We get hit by a rock, and then we say, the Lord's going to get you. Watch and see. We're evil. That's evil. And evil is born of men. That is utterly evil. To look for revenge is nothing more than us looking for revenge. That's our problem. A wound that's not healed will have you looking for revenge. Period. And when you look for revenge, you're not walking with the Father. No matter how much we claim to be walking with the Lord, we are not. Because we're looking for revenge. I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We defy him. We want instant vengeance. And that spirit of vengeance, being born of a womb, is quite strong. And if you don't die to your flesh daily, you'll operate again. In ventures, you'll begin defending yourself. Listen, folks, let, hear me close. The same people who want revenge spend all their time defending themselves. You know, that's a, that's a character trait. I have seen it. Did you see it with, uh, in the Old Testament with David and Saul? You saw that, right? The more corrupted a person becomes, the more they defend themselves. The more righteous a person becomes, they don't defend themselves at all. Have you all noticed that? When you defend yourself and defend your stance and your viewpoints and all this, that, and the other, you're drifting. You're drifting. I'll not defend myself. For what? That does no good. Does it? See, if you defend something, you're going to keep it. If you keep it, how can you grow? How in the world can we stay the same for years and years and years? You guys aren't. Thank God for that.
I mean, you guys really are not. But you know what's strange? You can go into, you can go from COT into some of the forums you guys used to be in, and it's a giant, a giant gap between your conversation now and how you conversate. And then, big gap. Because most people who come here to COT, they were, they were, they were looking for information. But they begin to find the love of Christ. And when they find the love of Christ, their conversation begins to change. It will either be absolutely hatred and bitter and turn away on day one or day 50. Or they'll start looking into the love of Christ. Because that is our focus here, is the love of Christ. Identification of the love of Christ is much more than what most people think. Because I'll say it again, our suffering is also managed. We couldn't suffer without God's approval. And he let you suffer. He placed that suffering upon you for a reason. Didn't he? God's in control of all things. It is impossible that he's not in control. He knows exactly where you are. Exactly. So then, you need not defend yourself, number one. Your defense is the Creator and Yeshua HaMashiach. You need not do that. Don't spend your life defending yourselves. You'll be forced to defend yourself and other things, and then it becomes a habit. When something becomes a habit, you'll think it's okay. When it's okay, guess what? That's being given over to a reprobate mind. Just like the Christians who sit there and watch pornography, and they think nothing is wrong with it. Or they're setting up as high as a kite. And they say, well, God made this naturally. But they're high as a kite. They've been doing it so long, they see no wrong with it. And that, again, is men calling right wrong and wrong right. Evil, good, and good, evil. So we can't slip that way. There's a multitude of people right now slipping. In many different ways. The other day, when I was being, you know, tested on a few things, I was in prayer, not thinking about, you know, the condition or anything, but it, it was as if the Lord gave me a list of things to write down. And when I wrote them down, it was a list of things, basic things he empowered us to conquer. But he revealed to my heart that people don't want to conquer what they love. And then it was ultimately revealed that people keep what they have fallen in love with. Whatever the condition. And a person keeps. It becomes their security. And then a slew of scriptures and books and chapters came behind it. Think about this. If you love it, you're going to keep it. If you love it, you depend on it too. If you love it, you'll defend it. Are you guys seeing this? If you love it, you'll defend it. So I ask you something. Do we defend our faith against doubt? we defend or do we defend our own sin which is it which one to defend your faith you must do so against doubt 
you find doubt. Not people. You cast doubt away. To defend your trust in the Lord, you cast doubt and worry away. Because that is unclean, isn't it? It's so funny because, listen, folks, i got to tell you this. I, I don't know about you. But my creator is my creator. I can't go to him willingly carrying something unclean. That is disrespect to his throne, to God's office, period. That's disrespect. I'm not going to him with those dumb things of my mind when I know better. Because I know better. And in the end, all the excuses of mankind won't work. If we were to die in five seconds, would we be in trouble? I don't know about you, but listen to me close. Listen to me close. I do what I do because of the cross. Because I fear the Lord. He is my creator. He did not create me to be condemned, but to have life. And I know only to follow him is to have that life. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of him because I don't want to be separated from his love. I can't survive without his love. I can't survive without it. I don't do well in an atmosphere of people's ways. I do not like man's ways. And everybody who knows me, they know I do not like man's ways. It is darkness to me. Flesh is darkness to me. Defending a flesh is darkness to me. It is nothing more than upholding sin. That I'm, I, I'm, we're not here to adopt sin. And the power of Christ in a person does what? It overcomes all things in the world. Did not Jesus overcome the world? Yes, he did, didn't he? Jesus overcame the world. Jesus also overcame death in the grave, didn't he? So what business have we not overcoming these things in our lives? I'll tell you why. It is impossible for you to have Christ and not overcome these things. Because if you don't overcome these things, you don't have Christ. Because if you don't overcome them, you're not going to have eternal life. Period. Because Jesus said so. He said it was him in you that overcomes these things, not you. I can't overcome something that's more powerful than me. But with Christ in me, there is nothing more powerful than him. It is Christ that is bringing me through the author and finisher of my faith. I don't bring me through. He does. He just simply said, accept my words, believe upon me. And to believe upon him means I'm not going to believe in anything outside of him. I don't want it. Pure and simple. We are flawed and filthy, dirty children. But through Christ, we have become righteous. We are the righteousness of Christ. That's a heavy statement. You are the righteousness of Christ. Because you may say, wait a minute, I thought Christ was righteous. Yes, he is. But you now are the righteousness of Christ. And if you're the righteousness of Christ, what business have you with darkness? You yield to your flesh, you yield to darkness. How many times does the Father have to tell us our flesh is dark and this is what we must overcome? The enemy we have to overcome has been with us since day one. I don't know about you. As for me in my house, we'll serve the Lord. This temple will be a living sacrifice. Because I'm giving up many things for the sake of Christ because of the cross. I don't want anything else in this temple. There's nothing on this earth that can save me from anything. 
to save my life is not to save me. In order for me to be saved, the cross has to come full circle. Jesus died for us. I don't seek anything in this earth. I don't seek anything in death. Nothing in life or in death can save me. Only Jesus can because he is my Savior. And because he went to go prepare a place for us. It is my reasonable service to owe a debt of love to you. And to give myself up as a living sacrifice. To give up all my ambitions in this world for the sake of his appointments. He has empowered me to do so, therefore I will do it. It's not everybody's calling. But it certainly is mine. Some of you who know me, you know when I get focused on something, nothing else exists. It's becoming a more serious walk every day. Times are changing so fast. So many people in danger. But those in rebellion will not be saved when they know better. It's time for us to be healed. It's time for all of us to take up our beds and walk. Jesus never said to the blind man, well, you just give it time. Have patience and you'll be healed. No, he said, get up and go wash your face in the sea of sins. After he put salve on his eyes. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he didn't say, well, just give Lazarus a few months. No, he called him forward. And you know what? Jesus called me, so guess what? I can be healed of all things because he called me. Now, my healing is that I may walk as an ambassador to him. My healing is not so I enjoy myself in this wretched world, but to walk as an ambassador in the world. This is a dark world. I can't walk in it without the light in me, and that light is Christ. In my house, I choose to have him occupy it. And I want nothing in this house that offends my Lord. I want it gone because I do reverence him. I do observe him. I do praise him for all things good and bad. All things, not some things. Good and bad things I praise him for. Unlike most, folks, I'm going to give you a small nugget that I have to go. When you can thank God, for the good and the bad things. Now you have an understanding of your own life. See, I know without the bad, I wouldn't know good. And without the good, without the good, I wouldn't see his salvation. It can be a small good too. The tiny goods for me is enough for praise. But even the times that were terrible, I always say, thank you, Lord. He demonstrated his great kindness and mercy. His long suffering, he did demonstrate. Anything that happened to me bad should have been a hundred times worse. Being born, I was a natural offense to him, and so were you. He did not look upon us with the eye of destruction, but with the eyes of love. That's the difference. A change in your mindset back into the word of God changes all things in your life. I encourage you not to keep a worldly mindset. Don't keep the old man that never worked for you. Put him to rest and don't resurrect him. We have entered into the days where the Lord says, don't go back to take anything out of your house. Don't look back. 
Sodom is surely going to be destroyed. Don't look back. Folks, God bless each of you. I'm going to switch over to Pastor Paul's. God bless all of you. I was trying to pull the chat room up this entire time. I can't see anything. Oh, well. Maybe we'll get it straight this evening. Remember, the Lord's the author and finisher of your faith. Collectively, let's not resist his word another day. This is that new day. In this day, let us not resist his words or his way. Let's fight the good fight of faith always, always. God bless.